Well, hello there, and I do hope you're all well. Got your seatbelts back on? Told you this clown make Anne Marie Trevelyan look like a mastermind champion in the making. Well, in this video, our turnip Tom Purr's glove was getting a grilling from SNP MP Stuart MacDonald, and don't anybody ask me to pronounce where his constituency is. I'm a Yorkshireman. I know my limitations, and I'm not going to try and make myself look a right prize clown. But anyway, Stuart MacDonald had two main questions to ask. One was capacity, i.e. how many will we be sending a year? And more importantly, what legal support will these vulnerable people be getting when they've arrived here? Let's just say from the off, he's not a fan of the agreement. More importantly, he thought Tom Poe's gloves answers were for the birds. Thank you, uh, Morning Minister, Morning Mr Hobbs. Uh, obviously we've debated this issue for several months and there's no need to, to, to go over all ground, you know what I think about this policy. And, uh, so just some factual questions and some supplementaries. First of all, we just mentioned Ukrainians and nationals there. Um, can I just ask about Ukrainians who, for example, have crossed into Northern Ireland from Dublin, um, so they're not using uh, dinghies or anything like that. Are they within the purview of this policy or are they not? Perhaps Mr Hobbs yeah. could just say something about that in terms so of how those have been handled. Today. Yeah, so I think we've published a, uh, an approach on people who come by the CTA who have arrived lawfully in the Republic of Ireland in terms of the leave that will be afforded to them. So they may, depending on the individual circumstances, they may not fall in the inadmissibility criteria. So that's the first element, is someone falls under the inadmissibility criteria for the UK. And as I say, I think we've published details of our approach to Ukrainian nationals who've arrived lawfully in the Republic of Ireland and come to the CTA. OK, uh, but you said May, so there is a possibility. Well, again, it's down to the individual case. Yeah. But in principle, the policy that has been published in respect of those crossing the CTA who've arrived lawfully in the Republic of Ireland of Ukrainian nationality would apply. OK, well, if you could write to us with a little bit more detail about that, because you are leaving open the possibility that Ukrainians who've crossed from Dublin to, to Belfast could conceivably end up in Rwanda. So I'd also like to, 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 to understand properly how that could happen. Mr. Hobbs, you yeah, also I would just make the point, of mm -hmm. course, very happy to look at that request in terms of rights the committee, but I'd just make the point again that we work case by case and we take into account all the circumstances that are relevant. That just says he'll say that a lot in this case by case basis if, if uh, each one of these people are going to be processed case by case why don't you just process them at the border and then decide whether the refugees are not instead of trying to flog them off to rwanda okay so on that note so let's say an afghan interpreter or somebody else who hasn't managed to get onto one of the government schemes does cross in a dinghy uh, the only members of their family outside of Afghanistan that they know are here. Are things like that going to be taken into account in terms of decision making, the fact that they have family here and, and nowhere else? So again, I would <coughs> make the point that in terms of Afghanistan, there are established safe and legal routes by which people should come to the United Kingdom. Well, if, if can get Nobody them. should be getting yeah. in a small boat to come to the UK because what they are doing is leaving what are safe countries with fully functioning asylum systems, taking all the risk that comes with he says that a lot and all, the leaving safe countries. As far as I know, there's no law to, to make them stay in the very first safe country they go to. Just saying, Tom. And what I'm not willing to do and what I won't do is say or do anything that gives credence to that evil business model. I've heard, heard your argument and obviously we take different views on that, but I just want to know the fact that the Afghan interpreter has family members here, is that taken into account into, in decision making, Mr Holmes? So in decision making, we will obviously take account of our Article 8 obligations under ECHR along with all our other ECHR obligations. Uh, so in the individual decision making, if there are uh, obstacles that would contravene our obligations under ECHR Article 8 or any other article, then that would be taken into account in the final decision on a case-by-case -case basis. You also mentioned sort of made a comparison with, with Dublin arrangements, but that is slightly different. You don't need to go through a lengthy process to establish whether, for example, somebody is LGBT or whether they are a, a victim of trafficking before it, it necessarily being able to establish whether or not it might be safe uh, to, to make a, a return under Dublin, though there are concerns with the Dublin process there too. The point is, though, you're, you're removing people to Rwanda and you are going to have to make these assessments. And at the moment, it takes you weeks in fact, it takes you months and years often to establish whether somebody is 
LGBT or at risk. How can we possibly be satisfied that undertaking this sort of assessment in weeks is going to get to the bottom of some of these issues and, and ensure that you're only uh, removing people that it's safe to remove to Rwanda? I can give the committee the reassurance that we will act with great care with the assistance of, of course, experienced caseworkers to work through those issues appropriately. How many caseworkers are going to be working on this? Um, I'm not in a position to give you a precise figure on this, but of course what we have is a um, we have a team of caseworkers who work on um, asylum-related matters every day of the year um, who will be working on this and will be making appropriate decisions about individual cases. Can you tell me more about how this is going to be done? I mean, is it a, a screening interview? Is it a two-hour interview and that is it? There's supposed to be access to, to legal advice, but what form does that take? Is it a, a phone call? Where are the people going to be when this process is undertaken? Can you say, uh, give us some detail on that, Mr Hobbs? Um, so, again, it will depend on the individual circumstances. Obviously, we have a range of accommodation. People will have access to legal aid as they would in the normal way in the inadmissibility, and uh, migrants who arrive in the UK have access through the legal aid procedure subject to the standard merits and uh, uh, affordability tests. So th th that's how they will access uh, legal aid. As I say, the caseworker will do the screening interview, they will g gather information from the individual, and they'll have the opportunity to bring further representations, both in the seven or 14 day window uh, once we've notified them of our intention to relocate them either to Rwanda or any other <coughs> country where the, we have a safe uh, ability to return them to. Uh, and further, if we, when we set removal directions, as you'll be aware, there is a further period in which people are notified to be able to bring any further representations that they wish to bring at that point. Two things on that though. I mean, the idea that people have proper access to legal representation within 7 or 14 days when they're at Napier Barracks or at this new uh, centre that's been built is you know, for the birds, really. At, at most, when you, sp you speak to people there, they are lucky to get a, a 60 second phone call with the solicitor. So can you tell me about the work that Home Office is going to do to make sure that people have proper access to legal advice and will be able to make submissions? And are you seriously saying to me that uh, submissions within 14 days followed upon uh, following up after an interview <coughs> is enough to be able to come to a conclusion on whether somebody is LGBT or a victim of trafficking, for example. That, that can't be done in that time scale, can it? We so will work case by case to make appropriate decisions taking into account all of those vulnerabilities and considerations, as you would rightly expect, making sure that people can access the legal advice mm. that they need in the way that Mr Hobbs has set out. Um, of course, it is imperative that that is the case and that that is done in the way um, that we would all want to see because we want this policy to succeed. So it is absolutely right and proper that we deliver that correctly because that is fundamental to making sure that this policy is delivered in the way well, that we believe There's absolutely nothing to suggest that the Home Office has the capacity to do that, but on another category, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children or age-disputed children in particular, there are hundreds of cases every year where the Home Office says someone's an adult and then it, after this age assessment process it's decided that they're a child. Again, if somebody is challenging a decision that they are an adult, um, Will you wait for the outcome of that challenge, including judicial review or appeal under the, the recent Act? So again, of course, you'll recognise, and we've debated this many times, that we're introducing considerable reform in the uh, age assessment space because we think it's important that we do that, particularly for safeguarding reasons that flow in both directions. Um, those matters must be concluded, of course, before someone would be um, relocated to Rwanda. Um, and again, it is right and proper that there is a proper process where that can be considered. What I don't want to do, again, is to get into a sort of running debate about cohorts, because all that serves to do is to, to tip the wink to evil criminal gangs about where they may well target vulnerabilities and try and exploit those vulnerabilities. Um, You're going to have to make that uh, policy public well, at some point. I mean, how I, can I would refer him back the policy if they don't even know what I, it is? I, I, would, I would refer you back, Mr um, McDonald, to comments that I've made previously about children in various debates that we've had um, an unaccompanied asylum seeking children in particular. Now, in terms of capacity, uh, Simon Fair asked you about this, it's not just an issue of how many the UK government wants to send, but it's also how much, how many Rwanda can accept. Am I right in thinking that over the last three or four years, the Rwandan asylum decision making body has made between 37 and 307 decisions each year, and is that a reflection of 
the numbers roughly that we can expect to be sent to Rwanda, if that's all they have the capacity to process. So this is an uncapped scheme, and we will work with the Rwandan government to deliver to places. Principle, but in reality, they have a. It's not just you can't just say we are sending five thousand this year. They can say nope, we are taking twenty or fifty. And <coughs> in the last few years, they've managed between thirty-seven and three hundred seventy sevens each year. This is a partnership, and it has to be progressed in the spirit of partnership. And that is why we will continue to have close, constructive dialogue to make to sure. That isn't that the, the crux of the matter? That is, a, that is pretty much one week of channel crossings. How are you going to deter anybody if, in reality, you are put, sending to Rwanda one in several several hundred? Obviously, a lot of this will depend on the flow of migrants that we see. And we will continue to work with the Rwandan government to deliver the places that we need to deliver the deterrent effect that is required in order to put to a stop these dangerous journeys. Um, there is already, as I've set out previously, accommodation available for this purpose. That is kept under constant review. Um, and the Rwandan government recognise, and actually I think they should be commended very much for the fact that they recognise um, that this is a global issue that needs global solutions. Um, they want to play their part in helping us to preserve life. They are as troubled as I am about the loss of life that we've seen. And I what know I'm saying is they may not have the capacity to, to, to do what you are wanting them to do. Final question, uh, throughout the passage of the debate, debates on this, you were always very clear that you were keen and you had been satisfied that what the government was doing was in accordance with um, our obligations under the Refugee Convention. If it was to be found by a court that that is not the case, presumably then you would review your policy in an attempt to try and make sure that it would be compliant with the Refugee Convention. Can I just make one other point, just to pick up on the, the earlier issue that, that you raised around Rwanda and capacity? I mean, it is worth pointing out that mm -hmm. Rwanda has hosted a total of 127,000 refugees and asylum seekers yes, but that's completely at different. the end of January that's 2022. So it, so it demonstrates, yeah. I think, no, that there is... people in refugee camps under the auspices of the UNHCR, yeah. you are talking about processing asylum seekers through their body who manage between 37 and 307 cases a year. Let me be very clear that the model that we are delivering with the Rwandans is not a camps-based, um, detention-based model, and I think it's important that that is on the record and is made very clear. The point I was making is that um, clearly the Rwandan government have expertise and experience of providing um, refuge and sanctuary for a very considerable making, number of people. Not in making decisions at scale and you mean, your own assessment of the asylum decision making body is not particularly positive. But on the Refugee Convention, if a court decides... That's why we're resourcing this properly, of course, through the agreement. If, if a court decides that this scheme is not in accordance with the Refugee Convention, you've said it's very important for you that the government does uh, fulfil its obligations under that convention. I assume that you would revisit the policy and make it convention compliant if required. We will abide by our international obligations at all times, as I've consistently set out, and I believe that this policy is compliant with those international obligations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Diane Abbott. Um. The more I watched this one, the more I thought this agreement ain't going to go through, is it? But I get the feeling they're not bothered either way, are they? If it goes through, they will say they are being tough on these people coming here illegally in dinghies. And if it doesn't, they'll blame it on lefty lawyers, probably Labour, and use it for a culture war narrative, won't they? What do you guys think? Right, I shall leave the video here until the next one, which is a proper eye-opener, I can tell you. If you're a fan of this agreement and think it's going to be a massive success, I've got bad news for you. It won't. It'll be more money than sense. But anyway... I shall leave the video here until the next time. I shall bid you farewell and take care.